This is Matt Dabbs at discipleship.org, and I'm with Dan Lights of the Bonhoeffer Project. He's the president and CEO, and he's also the lead pastor at Calvary Chapel in uh, San Diego. It's actually Calvary Chapel Oceanside. So it sounds like, are there multiple Calvary Chapels? In yes. San yeah, we're a franchise. Yeah, we're okay. a total franchise. Yeah. I, just, I mean, we don't call it a tribe. We don't call it a denomination. We're a franchise. Yeah. And, and I, I, I get it. I get 100%. <laughs> so... So we're going to talk a little bit about this articulating a clear gospel, having good gospel yeah. definitions. So how would you clearly define that word? Because we can mean a lot of things. We talk about like the good news. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting that you say that. It's actually one of the main sticking points that we actually ask a bunch of people. And it's actually part of our curriculum. And I often, you know, in, in a room, whether it's the size of, of our church or just even a, a room in a breakout session, I always say, if I was to ask each one of you to have a three by five card, and here's a pen, and I just said, hey, what's the gospel? I said, you know, for, for however many people are in here, 98% are going to give a varying degree different answer. And, and it's not because, you know, it's a very interesting thing. It's not because we don't know what the gospel is, but because I think it, it encapsulates so much that it, it's very hard to just say it's, it's one thing. You know, sometimes, you know, we could say euangelion, it's the good news, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which it is all those things. But it's also, I think this is one of the areas that I believe it, it's missed. It's what Jesus came preaching, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is, is often what I would say is, is an overlooked aspect of the gospel, but it's one of the most fundamental aspects of the gospel. and you know, even when Jesus gives us the, the model prayer in the Lord's prayer, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this idea that Jesus came preaching the kingdom, you know, he didn't come preaching the gospel. Again, the gospel's there, but it's encapsulated in who Jesus is, who he was, what he came to this earth to do, and all of the ramifications and blessings that come, which again, makes the answer so much bigger than a, than a one line definition and, you know, and, and more nuanced than just saying, well, Jesus died and rose. Yeah. And then even I would say, and, and here's another even sticking point. There's so many people that say, well, you've got to believe. Well, okay. I agree. But what do you mean by believe? So we get stuck on sometimes where we're, we're saying something to one another, but our language is so off that we we think we're saying the same thing. We're using the same language, but we mean something different in our heads. And so when I say believe, I mean, follow with all of my being and other people, when they say believe it's a tip of the cap to Jesus. So it's, it's all encompassed. And I think in, in what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus to not just uh, articulate or understand that, you know, those things about Jesus but he did those for you so that you can be a true reflection of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So you have a kingdom gospel. So you yes. have King Jesus, Jesus, the Christ, anointed one, Messiah, all that right. language coming, preaching yes. good news of the kingdom to repent, you know, right. turn, turn from the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of light, right. you know, right. so there is some response on our part that is yes. connected with this good news, with the gospel. Yeah. And I think, and, and again, I don't want to, you know, upset any of my Arminian friends or Calvinist friends. There's, but there's a both and there is a response base to the gospel. There is a decision that I have to make every day to, to get out of bed and say, Lord, today is yours. So it's, a, it's an ongoing surrender. Repentance is an ongoing changing of the mind. It's not, I mean, yes, there is that initial man, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, that recognition. But as Paul graduated, if you will, as he continued to grow in the fear and the love of Jesus, that's like towards the end of his ministry is when he said, what a wretched man that I am. It's, it's the further you get, or the, the closer you get to the light, the more it exposes the darkness of our heart. So it's an ongoing repentance, not just a you know, what, what Bill Hall likes to say in his different books, it, it, you know, the gospel of simply salvation or, or the gospel of the consumeristic gospel, or it's, you know, it's just a ticket to heaven. I mean, I, I, this is how I put it. If I was to preach the gospel at my church and my gospel consisted of 
who wants to be forgiven and who wants to go to heaven. My, my asset, I assert who doesn't like, who doesn't want to be forgiven and go to heaven. But if that's all the gospel is, and then we're portraying that all Jesus wants is for the tip of the cap and to go to heaven, we miss the follow. We miss the every day being changed and transformed in the image of Christ. We, we miss what God is trying to do. Galatians 5, the fruit that is supposed to come from us, it becomes, again, just something that we're passively engaged in versus an act of transformation every single day. Yeah, that's really good. I, you know, it makes me think of Dallas Willard. He talked about the vampire mm-hmm. Christians. You know, yes. he went in for his blood. It's like, that's oh, right. That stings a little yeah. bit, you know? Yeah. And then Bonhoeffer, where he kind of really pointed out this and Willard as well, the gospel of cheap grace, yeah. where we, we've cheapened what Jesus did on the cross, that all it was was for our, you know, affability, for our affluence and, and, and not for our change. Like I was told my, my congregation, Jesus didn't die on the cross to leave you the way he found you. He died on the cross to change you, to make you more into the image of Jesus. And change is hard. I mean, like who wants it? Not many people want change, especially if it involves hard work. And again, we just live in a culture where hard work and change, ah, that sounds like a a lot of work. Let me, you know, kick that can down the road. And, you know, the gospel calls us to account. It calls us to move. It calls us to press in. If I'm going to be an apprentice of Jesus, I'm going to be his follower. Well, I want to learn from him, be like him and be changed every day to act and function more like him. Yeah. And that, that's going to challenge every core of our being. And, you know, part of the good news is that he's done the heavy lifting. He, like he, he lifted what we couldn't lift, you know, and that right. doesn't mean there's not anything left for us to do or, or participate in, but right. you know, we can't resurrect ourselves. We can't, no, absolutely we can't not. forgive our own sins. Right. You know, By like grace, all, you've been saved through faith. That's it. I right. can do it. It's not a work that I can do. It's, it's all his function. It's all his work, but, but I'm called to respond, to respond to that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a kingdom gospel, like you're saying. And so there's competing kingdoms involved. I, I, I think it was right. Walter Brueggemann who said, uh, he changed up the heading where in the Bible it has, when Jesus is on trial, it says Jesus before Pilate. And then he flipped it to Pilate before Jesus. Mm. Oh man. He stands Absolutely. before the King of Kings. Like. Does he, does pilot be a different conversation, a different conversation, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, absolutely. Wow. I'm standing before, before the King, you know, and, and even like the, the rider on the white horse from revelation and, mm-hmm. you know, he's got the sword and all, it's like, man, he's powerful. Absolutely. Everything's got absolutely. Him. Yeah. And he doesn't, and here's the thing. He doesn't, he doesn't leave any stone of our heart unturned. Now we can, we can rebuff his affections. We can rebuff him, him trying to, to change those things. And that's, it's something that I'm really right now, just again, you're catching me on a week where I've had, I've had a week. I've had a week, brother. And in this week, I'm dealing with quite a number of people who are resistant to change. And it's easier in our culture to just bounce, to, to go to the next church down the street because you're not going to be held accountable there. And I, I was just telling one of my pastors yesterday, I know it's a double-edged sword, but I wish we would kind of go back to where there wasn't as many churches and there was one club that you could go to because that's all there was. You know, in the, the church of Corinth, you couldn't just go down to the next church. If you didn't like Paul's letter, you're like, man, this is kind of hard, bro. You couldn't just bail out and go to a different church. You'd have to change and press in if you wanted the benefits of Christian community and what God wants for us, but we're, we're just in a culture that's very user-friendly and you do you, whatever it is that you're feeling, there's another church pastor leader who's willing to tell you, yeah, those bad people over there, even though they were trying to hold you accountable. Um, you know, so it makes it very hard to shepherd people that don't want to be shepherded or who don't like to be told, Hey, the gospel wants to touch that area of your life too. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, nah, not, not right now anyway. Yeah. And even that goes back to Jesus, right? Cause he's the chief shepherd and the overseer of our right. souls that first Peter five, maybe, yes. um, you know, so yeah. it all goes back to him and, and his authority. And so, you know, we kind of talked a minute ago about how we have language and sometimes we talk past each other. And so it's important to have precise definitions or kind of commonly yeah. 
understood definitions of terrorite. So what are the, the repercussions of, of having consistent terms and, and not like what, sure. what happens when you don't do that? So I, I'm really glad you asked. Uh, Dr. Jim Thomas, he's one of our um, alum on the Bonhoeffer Project. He's actually our uh, director of our publication, Bonhoeffer Press. We wrote a book together called The Language of Disciple Making. And it, we, we felt it was, there was such a strong emphasis on, and what we found, not just with the gospel, but even, even on just terms that we use all the time, terms that you and I have talked about just in this conversation, disciple making, discipleship, gospel, kingdom. There are so many words that we, we look at each other, we say, and we nod and we assume you know what I mean, because you nodded. I know what you mean, because I nodded. And, and we're literally talking past each other. And so what we've found, not just in the disciple making cultures, but in like churches, churches in general, if you don't have robust, known, and I would even say memorized definitions for words, you're going to, you're going to frustrate yourself because you're going to wonder why people aren't getting it. But it's that they are thinking something else in their head. So they're responding the way that they think that you said that. I mean, listen, if you're married, you, you, you go through this all the time. Women, men, there, there's differences in the sexes, beautiful complementary roles that God has given us. However, they think differently than we do. And so a lot of times my wife, we, when we'll do marriage conferences, I, I say one of the one of the keys that we use is, is a phrase that I like to say, what did you mean by that? Mm. And it's, and it's a question that constantly has to be asked, even in conversations where we think we're on the same page, because I've learned enough in almost 20 years of marriage that here's what I've heard you say, is this what you meant? Because I've been wrong before and I've <laughs> spent the next hour and a half responding to what I heard you say but that's not what you meant to say, or you said it differently than I received it. So if we don't have robust definitions, robust known language, we're going to find ourselves just spinning around in circles. We're, we're going to be left with, why are we not moving forward? Why is there no traction? Why aren't people understanding? Why do I feel like I'm just talking to the wall? I keep saying these things and nobody's moving forward. So it, it stunts our growth because we don't know what's meant by being a disciple, you know, because yeah. most people say, well, I go to church. Well, okay. I mean something a little different because I tell my people all the time, the goal of the church isn't that you just come back. It's that you'd be transformed. Like that's the goal of the gospel is to change you, transform you, make you into the image more every day like Jesus. But if we're not articulate about that, if we're not telling people what we mean by that, we're going to raise a generation. And I think we already have, uh, unfortunately, I think we're feeling the effects of a generation of ambiguous terms. Everything means everything. Church going means the gospel and salvation and discipleship. And, and if I just go that one check in a week, then everything's fine. And God doesn't need to touch the other areas of my life. He doesn't need to save my wallet. He doesn't need to save my marriage. He doesn't need to save these other things. If I can just go up to church, get that check-in, then we're good because our language has been ambiguous. And so again, just to answer your question, it, it, it creates turmoil and it's turmoil that, that we don't intend, but it's, it's for a lack of intentionality. And, and a lot of times we don't know that we don't know uh, because we're saying the same word, everybody's nodding, but then we're looking around mm -hmm. going, why isn't anything moving? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I was in a Facebook conversation the other day where um, got into a, a, a debate, I guess, in a sense of does God want to redeem American Christianity? Okay. Mm. And I'm like, well, God wants to redeem everything. And this right. other person's like, well, God, God, God won't redeem anything. He doesn't want to redeem. And I'm like, like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, I'm, I'm a little confused by that statement. Like, right. I would sure think he wants to redeem everything. And what this person was kind of saying, like I'm using the word church and when they're saying church, they mean institution. Yes. I'm thinking people in a church body. Right. They're thinking right. Western attractional organizations, those are the Christianity. And he's like, 
Like God must not want to even redeem that. And I'm like, but even that God wants to redeem because that means whatever that means is going to get a lot right. of what he wants. So now right. in my mind, no matter how you slice it, he wants to redeem it. But right. in this person's mind, that seemed quite irredeemable on an institutional level. And, but we were just talking past each other for forever until finally. Right. And, you know, and yeah, go ahead, please. Until you ask some questions, you know, and then you understand right. when yes. I say discipleship, you know, I mean like what Jesus did and you mean like have a fellowship luncheon at church or something or a small, right. you know, a small group that, you know, maybe you pray and have a lesson and go home. Right. Yeah. And, and where you find it, and, and obviously it's, it's prevalent in the American Christian church. It's, it's prevalent in, in all of church, but where it's, where, where I saw it, I think the first time that I really saw it tangibly was when I, you know, a Mormon knocked on my door and especially Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, like they're the nicest people on the planet. And when they talk, you're like, dude, I think these guys are Christians. But it only comes out when you start talking about definitions of words, mm -hmm. because even the word Jesus, Jesus seems pretty innocuous. We know who we're talking about. Jesus, Bible, here's who Jesus was, son of God. But if you talk to a Mormon about who Jesus is, they got a different definition. It's a different Jesus. It's not the Jesus that we see in scripture, the only begotten son of God. We see it's a, a, a brother of Lucifer, just one of the spirit sons of Elohim, the different Jesus. He's not the third person or the, third, or the second person of the Trinity. He, he's just, he's just another good Mormon on another planet. Dude, those are so vastly different. But if you're just having a, an innocuous at the door conversation, you're going to think like, I'm pretty sure this guy's got it. Like, man. Oh, and then, and I get that all the time. I get people coming uh, emails and knocking on my door. Like why, you know, uh, why aren't Mormons in the King? Cause I, I talked to them about the gospel and they are like all in. It's like, because it's a sneaky way or, or even Jehovah's witnesses. When I say Jesus, they're like, yeah, Jesus. I'm like, but you mean Michael, the archangel. And I mean, the only begotten son of God. And you know, and you see, oh yeah, that's where we differ. But the language sounds affable. Oh man, high five, same team. It's not the same team. And so even when, especially in leadership, when you're trying to take people somewhere, if your definition is not included in your destination, they'll pull you off track because they think you're going somewhere else. And it's critical. And it's been critical to my leadership to define what it means by, you know, where we're going. We're going to this destination. Oh, you mean this? No, I don't mean that at all. Let me define to you what I mean by that. So definitions are just critical. Yeah, no, I think that's really well stated. And I, I, I just kind of think it back to conversations I've had where I, I thought we were on the same page and then you find out that, yeah. you know, that you're not. And, and then you're like, you know, this actually takes time. This takes time. It takes relationship. It takes nuance. It's like, you know, we live in a microwave, social media, instant contact. Right. So you make a statement and you move on. You reply to the comments, right. you move on. And it's like, this, this is going to take like getting in the weeds a little bit and really getting in the scriptures and like when that word was used, what were they talking about and how did they use it? And what was being said? And, you know, the kingdom is mentioned, I don't know how many times, a lot, you know, in the new right. Testament. So what are they talking about when they say that? Like, let's make sure that we're not asegeting this thing and like taking our meaning and just imposing it into the text, but like going right. back to the text and saying like, what were they really saying? And what did that mean right. when they heard it? And what did that mean in their world when they said, when they said Caesar is the one who has the, you and Helion, and he's the, the, the right. soter, he's the savior and he's the bringer of all that stuff. You know, they have a background, they've got a history there right. that they're That's hearing right. that through. And then it's like of Kings and everything else. It's like, and kingdoms. And it's like, well, no, there's the real King and kingdom. And he fought for that kingdom and in in a, in a, through a submissive, obedient to the father posture and won ultimate victory over sin and death. Like it's a whole other story and, and it, it makes so much more sense when you're able to kind of put it on the canvas of like their world and and the scriptures and what they're saying and then like take that whole thing and map it over here for us and go okay right given on that truth like what do we what do we do with that like what is our response right. to, how do we proclaim right. that right how do we proclaim yeah. the in the world today and create that kind of right. And, and for those who may be listening that, that don't think that this is like, oh, you know, I get it. That was 2000 years ago. We know, we got to know the culture. I, I want to, I wrote this in the book, but I, 
I have to highlight like five years ago, if your name was Karen, no one cared. Cool. Now, like every Karen in the world is like, oh my gosh, like I'm thinking about changing my name because the culture has changed the meaning. And so now it becomes like, again, just think about 500 years from now, should the Lord tarry, are people going to have the context to read the things that are being said? And they're like, what's this Karen thing? You're going to have to know and understand contextually where that came from. What were the implications? What were the ramifications? What was meant by it? It was derogatory in certain respects. It could be racist in some respects. There's all sorts of implications of just a name that has always just been a name, but then all of a sudden culturally something got associated with it. Now it became a loaded name and, and carried with it angst and discontentment and rage and meaning that it never in its inception had. And so you even need to know historically in a timeline when that shift happened. Yeah, it was actually 2020 about that that name changed because before that you can't use it in that context, but after that you can, and it makes sense. So it's just, it, it shows you that even in our current modern day culture, how fast a word can go from meaning one thing to another. So, you know, here we are 2000 years removed from most of the New Testament writings. Now, what did it mean to them? And, and how was it received in their context and culture? And, and then how are we maybe presupposing what it is that we think that they thought. And instead of doing the hard work of, of understanding what their definition was to be able to understand the context better. That's good. You know, so I think a really important question is what makes the good news, good news. And I, I'm, I'm sure NT writer, somebody's probably said it that way. It's probably bounced around on my head because, you know, somebody like that said that, but it, it's, but the follow-up is, is is the good news still good news, right? And yeah, sure, certainly I know it is, like I believe it is, but I'm not so certain that the way that the gospel has been packaged, that right. a lot of Christians still understand what makes it good, you know? Yeah. Because now- You know, there, there was a, sorry, continue. I, I don't want to cut go you ahead. off. I've got, I've got where I'm going. You go ahead. So it, 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 I, I said this, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I was doing some research on- the gospel um, and a subtle change that happened in the, all I can say is the American presentation of the gospel during the time of, of Billy Graham and then prior. So again, in, in Billy Graham's era, when he began to preach, so if you watch some of old Billy Graham sermons where he was doing, you know, big crusades, you know, there was this, uh, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, accept him and, and they lived in a culture and you, you would hear it a lot of times, you know, if you died tonight, there was a palpable and, and what we don't understand contextually, culturally, the Cold War during a lot of those things was, what, you know, there was kids doing duck and cover drills because of nuclear fallout and people had masks in their home because what if Russia launched a nuke? So there was a constant threat of what if we got nuked? So this idea of you could die tonight was real. It was palpable. It was tangible. And so the savior and accepting him as a means to absolve you of your sins was, was more real than it is today. But the, the interesting thing, that, and here's where I think that repackaging has happened prior to that. And I don't know, I, I'd love to do a study on when the verbiage changed before this kind of era, the word used to be surrender. You need to surrender your life to Jesus. And then it changed somewhere in the 60s, I want to say, to accept. Well, those two words have very different connotations. To, to accept something is to acknowledge that it's present. Okay, I accept that. To surrender to something is wholly different. Like to surrender something, not just acknowledging its presence, but to give up, right? There's a, there's a whole different connotation. So from the 60s onward, you would constantly hear, you, you know, you're a sinner, you need a savior, savior, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And millions of people, mm -hmm. tip of the cap, I accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because why? I, and what they're saying is, I accept the free grace given to me. I accept heaven. 
I accept the forgiveness of sins. I don't want the other part, which is like follow and change and all the stuff that's hard. I just want to know that I'm going to heaven and that I'm better than that guy over there. And that was kind of the, we, we, and somewhere in that time frame, it's like, what's the lowest bar that we can set so that people can just get in? But that's not the gospel. The gospel is like, you can't. Like, there's nothing you can do. Like, you are a wretched sinner. And, and I think we've gotten away from, you know, even the word propitiation, again, big theological word that's in scripture, the appeasement of God's wrath. Like, that's not a happy story. That's a absolvement of guilt. And God's wrath is upon you. And without his, not, not without you accepting his gift, without you surrendering to his will, without you surrendering to him as God and king and holy and perfect and just, you miss the, the, the most, I think, beautiful and damning in a good way part of the gospel to know your wretchedness compared to a holy and perfect God. Yeah, and I think that with the Billy Graham days, it seems like it was kind of boiled down to problem solution and easy decision making. You know, we're absolutely, we present a problem, here's a solution, here's what you got to do, get on board, lowest bar possible. Uh, although, the, you know, my understanding, I think Bill Holt and others have said it too, is, you know, maybe they did point people to local churches for discipleship and things like that. But yes, it wasn't in the core message, seems to me. And, and I'm not about through lots of tape and stuff like that, or, you know, YouTube, a lot, some, a little bit, but not, not a ton, you know, so there, there's that piece, but, you know, even like penal substitutionary atonement, you know, right. it's kind of gone out the window and, you know, people listening to this or watching this will either agree or disagree if that's, that's good or bad. But, you know, some of what we've done is very culturally appropriated because we've said, you know, because now we're, we're very trauma informed, which is good. You know, we need to be very sensitive sure. of trauma. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad thing. But now we're saying, okay, you know, what a father really put his son through that, what kind of evil father would it take to put their son through? Something like that. Yeah. But Jesus is also God. Like they're also the same person. Like he's right. He's actually taking it upon himself, you know, to do that. Right. There's a little more nuance to it than, than that much. Right. Stuff. So, you know, it gets right. in the weeds there, but my point is, is that some of the very easy things to articulate, like Jesus died in my place, Jesus took on the, the punishment for sin, that sin results in death. And he took on death and then the resurrection of Christ brings me hope. And he did that for me. And now you know, like in Romans six, like in baptism, I'm buried with Christ to be raised with Christ. And now I can right. unite myself with Christ and experience all that. Like that's good news, but it feels to me like in the last, I don't know, 20 ish years or more, probably more. And maybe, well, there's reasons. I don't know all the reasons, but it feels like the gospel has gotten very murky. It's gotten very complicated. It's convoluted. It, it, it's not really any of this, but we've kind of made it these things. Yeah. 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 It's very hard to articulate. You want to be like, well, yeah, he died in my place, but what that really means is, and then, yeah, his blood is for my sins. But what that really means is, and then, and then we get into like all this convolution that it takes a, a doctorate or a MDiv or something to be able to <laughs> right. with this message. And then everyday, everyday Christians are like, I don't have a clue how to articulate this thing. There's so much nuance. There's so much going on. Right. And so I just think there's a lot of confusion and complication. In a sense, not well. I think, you know, yeah. And with the with the rise of kind of the evangelicals and the deconstructionists, you, you see, as people are are kind of tracking down that road, the nuns, the you know, past the has been, whatever you want to call them, because we have. And here's again, this is a nuance that I'm working out of my mind. So this thought isn't fully fully baked, but we we have made so much of your faith your own faith that you get to make your own gospel. Mm -hmm. Like your gospel gets to be tailor-made to what you need yeah. it to be yeah. Yeah. versus no, here's what it is. And I need to rise to what it is right. yep. to uh, 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 obtain what it is because it's not my gospel to be given. It was the gospel given to me. And so I, I, it is behooven upon me to make sure that I'm articulating what was given to me not, not to mess up the recipe or say, well, I mean, you know, penile substitutionary atonement, like that's cool and all, but here's what I want to say. 
here's what I think, or here's, let, let me lower the bar to get as many people from that black and white, you know, let's get them over the bar and get them in. I don't know if we're allowed to do that. I don't know if that's, that's not, to us. Yeah. Well, it's certainly cultural appropriation. Now the gospel yeah. does, the, 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 there are certainly, the gospel was embedded in an original culture. Like we know that. Right. And the gospel Absolutely. has to communicate all that truth into our culture today. We understand that. Understand. And if you go to another culture, you go to Africa or somewhere and you try to, to communicate the gospel or India or other places, like there might be some things you have to think about to say it in a way that they will understand it, but you're yeah. still having to start with the core truth of what the Bible actually said. No matter what you're trying to say to like help this guy hear it, you're still trying to get them to hear what it said. Right. The moment that you say, well, I'm going to take what it said and then blend it with what all you think and then make something different out right. of it. You know, now we've got a real issue in, in my Yeah, view. I don't mind. Like, and I like illustrations that illustrate what the gospel is to, you know, that's what Jesus did with parables. Hey, here's a yes. hard truth. Let me give it to you in a parable that'll help you, you know, you're an agricultural culture. So let's, uh, here's something that'll help you understand. Here's a field, here's some wheat, here's some seeds. It made it understandable, but yeah, you can't change the, the meaning or, or the implications of what was said. I don't want to change the gospel to suit the culture. I want to make sure that my gospel speaks to the culture accurately. But again, it goes back to our definitions. What, what are we talking about? And you can't make a gospel. The gospel isn't, I mean, it is for you, but you can't make it your own gospel. It's his gospel. It's his yeah. truth. And you got to proclaim his truth his way. Now, one of the sticking points, it seems to me, is that we're, you know, you're kind of saying, okay, we need a clearly defined gospel. Certainly the Bible needs to define what that is. We need to propagate those definitions within our spheres of influence in our churches. But then I, I, for me, the sticking point kind of gets into, and, and there's no perfect, I guess, answer to this, but like, how do you take sure. the 150 or 200, how many scriptures there are, you know, 500 scriptures, whatever it is, and like boil that down into something for lack of a, a better word is like enforceable. You know what I mean? It's like, sure. <laughs> how do you, how do you like, make that the common parlance of the congregation, you know, and, and part right. of that is the repetition and speaking it yeah. and backing it up biblically and we're going, going Bible to definition rather than definition of Bible. It's like, you know, those sorts of things, but is it, is there any reasonable way to help more people adopt what some group concludes is the yeah. right combination of things? Does that make sense? Yeah, that was, that's good. I, I, I really appreciated even that question because it's got, it's got so much nuance to it because again, in our, uh, big box church culture, really asking any, anything of anyone other than coming and showing up, it's like, you know, we've made the bar so low and so consumeristic that it's like the moment you're like, Hey, we put the sauce packets behind the counter now. Now you have to ask for them. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to a different restaurant. This is ridiculous. So that's the kind of, on the precipice of offendedness is where our culture lives. So the moment that you ask them to do anything, you're going to get blowback. And so you just, number one, you've got to be ready for that. But again, that's kind of what Jesus said is going to happen. Like they're going to, you're going to be hated for my namesake. So just like, if you're, if you got into the pastorate because you wanted everyone to like you, you got into the wrong line of work because that's not what Jesus got into it for. People hated him for his name and what he stood for. But I, I, I've got kind of like a two-part answer to your question because I don't think it's wrong to require and say, hey, this is what we're asking everyone to memorize. This is what we're asking everyone to understand and know. I think the context is important. Like, I don't know if that, you know, even at our church, we would take a you know, couple of weekends. Hey guys, grab your Bibles. You all got a handout. And what we're doing today is we're going to be memorizing some scriptures. Um, I don't know how that would fly. I really don't. We actually have, and again, this is kind of more nuanced as, as the way God has called us as a church to function, right? We're in the middle. We're probably about three and a half years into creating a disciple making culture in our church. And so right now our church is about 2,500, 3,000 and we've, we've created a disciple making groups, right? That's kind of our vessel, our, our vehicle to get people in. And one of the requirements as we're kind of 
mulling over what this looks like to go through one of those and to come out the other side as, as what we call a disciple maker, you have to know the navigator's bridge analogy or their illustration. And because it, it's so funny, yesterday I was talking with my group of guys. I got three guys that I'm taking through right now. And they were talking about how uh, they were really rusty on the gospel. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, we were having a men's group night and it was like everybody was on their own, but a new guy showed up on that night and said, hey, where is everybody? And they said, well, why don't you come with our group? We're going to get pizza. Well, they're going out to pizza and they find out, dude, real quickly, they're like, this guy's not saved. He doesn't know Jesus. And so they all kind of tag teamed, but they all found in their even tag teaming that they're like stepping all over each other. That, that, that it was just, they were like a rusty blade. They, they had forgotten kind of the, yeah, I mean, like Romans 323, I think it is. And they're just, you know, like, I think all have sinned and fallen short, right? I, all, and you, like they're, they're, they're indicting themselves as they're sharing the gospel going, oh my gosh, I need to get better at this. And so it was really cool just to hear them share this story just yesterday morning as I'm telling them, like, I want you to know the gospel so that when, not if, when God brings into your fear, your path, your everyday communication, if somebody says, what must I do to be saved? You're not bringing them to me. You're like, hold on, let me call my pastor. He'll walk you through it. Or why don't you come to church with, with me this Sunday and you can hear it. Like you have to be able to be Philip the evangelist and be like, how do I read this? And you're like, here, let me hop into the chariot and tell you. And then they're running to, to the puddle of water saying, right there, I can be baptized right now, right? And so I, I think we need to get back to a more robust ask of our people. I think, I'll be honest with you. I know there are people who are like, anytime you ask them to do a hard thing, they're gonna, they're gonna bail out. But I think there's people who are actually hungry to, to do more, to know more, to be challenged in their faith. And I think the church needs to step up and do that. Well, I appreciate you sharing all these things. Is there like maybe one practical piece or something that churches or, or pastors can do? Well, again, I think, so let me, let me, Give an illustration back in one of my seminary courses, Dr. John Dixon, he was doing some uh, New Testament research and he found that in the early church, not, I mean, post New Testament, early church, there were like, especially in Rome, there were criteria for entrance into the church. There was like 180 hour plus study and, and theological tests. Think of, think of like a citizenship test in America. You had to know things before they let you in. And I don't mean like that you weren't saved, but like, hey, if you're going to be in the church, we got to know you're serious about this. And so we've lowered the bar for entrance into the church so much that I think there's just, there's plenty of people just, just, you know, playing church. They're not really in, they're not really committed. They're, they're there because maybe you've got good coffee that week or the, the, the worship is entertaining enough. But I think we need to ask people. So I just, like I said, for us, we've got our bridge illustration in a lot of our documentation. It's out in front of people. It's going up soon on one of our walls. The people will often see it. And they're just, you have to keep putting it in front of people. One of the phrases that I like to say, and I, I probably stole this from somewhere or somebody stole it from somebody and then told me, but when you're sick of saying it, people are just hearing it for the first time. It's got to be constant. It's got to be constant, constant, constant to where you're almost like, I hate saying this because I feel like I'm just a broken record. Yeah. But how many times, you know, did Jesus say, repent, repent, repent? People are always like, gee, again, he had to get it in front of people just to, so that people understood how serious mm -hmm. repentance mm -hmm. is. So we've got to constantly have it on the tip of our tongues and we've got to be ones that are, that are not afraid to do it as well. And it's not just something that we tell people to do, like with our disciple making groups, that's not just something I do. And I tell other people to do, it's something I'm doing as well. I can't expect my people to do something yeah. that I'm not doing. So it's just gotta be all the way around. And that's my kind of practical, we've gotta be doing it as well. That's so good. Yeah, it took me a while to learn that in the communication side, if I ask myself that you have to repeat yourself like far more yeah. than you could ever believe. And then I ask myself, right. okay, what did I preach about last week? Okay, got it what I preach about two weeks ago. Eh. Okay. I think I got that. How many weeks do I have to go back before I can't tell you? It's probably not very many. 
you know, it's no, not, it's not, it's not some, some weeks. It might be not even last week, you know? So if, if I'm yeah. stuck with that, you know, then people are not remembering and, and they just need to hear those core truths over and over and over again, you know, over and over. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That. Well, you're going to be at Amen. the forum coming up and we'll put links to that in the description, but also the main thing is we do want to point you to the Bonhoeffer project and the resources that they have. And uh, we'll put links to, uh, to that in the, the video and podcast description, but we're super uh, happy to have you on the, the recording today, Dan, on the podcast. And Amen. YouTube. Thank you. My Appreciate brother. you. Appreciate it, Matt. Blessings to you guys.